This is the second part of our lecture on Jan van Eyck. Uh, mostly we'll be seeing pictures of the Madonna and uh, some saints. The first image we're going to look at is not a painting, it's a drawing on panel. And it's a little image of Saint Barbara. As you can see, it's only slightly higher than 12 inches. Uh, it's in the museum in Antwerp. And someone has added some paint to it, but it, it's not painted uh, for the most part. Uh, it is a very detailed drawing. But it is on panel, on oak. And so one of the ideas is that this may be an underdrawing that was left unpainted. You know, was it originally intended to be a drawing and seen as a drawing? I think that's possible too. Um, but the other possibility is that it was an underdrawing uh, that was never finished. It is dated, however. There is a date on it. So we know that it wasn't left unfinished by Jan van Eyck's death, which was in 1441, uh, because this painting was painted in 1437. Now, what's the legend of St. Barbara? Um, St. Barbara was one of the early Christian martyrs uh, at probably the time of Diocletian or you know, a pagan era. And her father wants to preserve his daughter's virginity, presumably to make a good marriage or something like that. And um, he is going to have a tower built and she will live in this tower. And the workmen are putting the tower up and Barbara goes and gives the workmen some other instructions. She tells them that they should create the tower with three windows. She changes the design a bit. And the three windows then would be in honor of the Holy Trinity. Well, Dad comes back and he says, well, why did you change the design? Why, why three windows? And she tells them, because I'm a Christian. And three windows symbolizes the Holy Trinity. Her father is furious. He's going to kill her. And there's, she's fleeing from him. He's following her. There's all sorts of uh, near misses. And he is struck by lightning and killed. Uh, eventually, Barbara is martyred. Uh, as uh, as a Christian. Uh, uh, and so we see her with the symbol of martyrdom, uh, the palm branch. They sometimes call them the martyr's palm. I think the idea is they get to heaven and they're given palm branches. So we see beautiful, delicate Saint Barbara seated here with as with her beautiful robes all around her, right in front of this incredible tower that looks like a Gothic structure, uh, and workmen, you know, busily going about their business, and we'll see some details of those. And here you see the construction workers. Now, this kind of drawing, uh, is really interesting, not just to art historians, but to people who study the history of technology. Because it seems to be so accurate that they can figure out you know, building techniques. You know, how, do, how do people go about this? Um, and there are a number of works of art in the history of art where people look at the uh, drawings of the artist to see things about daily life. For Jan van Eyck, these would have been naturalistic details. So here you see the details. This is another one of these tiny little pa paintings. It's just, just 12 inches and a quarter high. It's in Berlin, and Berlin has Fantastic art, but this is certainly one of the gems of the collection. Uh, it shows the Madonna in the church. And so you see this image of Mary, tiny little image of Mary, but she's gigantic in the proportions of the picture. She, you know, her head rises clear up to the triforium of this Gothic church. Uh, and 
symbolically, Mary is associated with the church. She is seen as the embodiment or the personification of the Church of Christ. And so, as Panofsky said, and uh, you know, many people have repeated, it's not just the Madonna in the church, it's the Madonna as the church, or the Virgin Mary as the church, personifying the church. Now, the church they're talking about when they say you know, she embodies the church is the Church of Christ who is made up of the faithful, uh, but here, quite literally, it is a church building, and a beautiful Gothic church it is. You'll see the light shining through the clerestory windows, and shining on the floor, and shining through the entranceway. But there's something a little odd about this light. It's as though, you know, it's really coming through the north side of the church, because we can see through the rood screen on the right, uh, in the distance, we'll have a detail of that soon, uh, that that is the altar of the church. And generally, the high altar would be in the eastern end of the church. So the wall that we're seeing is the is going to be from the north. And generally, in northern climates, you know, you're not usually going to see a lot of you know, bright sunlight coming in from the north. So this is conceived of almost as, as miraculous light, certainly emphasis on light. Uh, light is a symbol uh, of divinity. Uh, and in the case of the Virgin Mary, it also, as we've seen before, serves as a symbol of the virgin conception of Christ and the virgin birth. And Mary is compared to the sun. Uh, she's often considered to be the woman clothed in the sun from the apocalypse. And just to show you we're not making this up, uh, we also have an inscription on the hem of her red dress in, in gold letters as though it were embroidered there. It's in Latin, of course, and uh, this is partially the translation. Uh, she is more beautiful than the sun. For she is the brightness of eternal light and the unspotted mirror of God's majesty. Now, those are verses from the Book of Wisdom in the Bible. And some of you are saying, what? I've never heard of a Book of Wisdom. Uh, you probably have a more modern Protestant version of the Bible. Um, there are a number of books of the Bible that Protestants uh, eventually took out of the, of the Bible. Um, I think in the King James Version, or the Authorized Version, it was something like in the 11th or 12th edition, they removed these books. So originally it was part of them. Um, and they are things like the Book of Wisdom, uh, Maccabees, um, the Book of Tobit, uh, parts of Daniel. Um, and the wisdom books were probably removed because they were interpreted in a Marian fashion. So of course, the Catholic Church retains those books that the Protestants consider uh, less than canonical. And you know, there, there was no distinction made uh, in what, you know, 1430s and the 1440s. Uh, there were no Protestants. Uh, well, there were a few, some people protesting uh, off in Bohemia, but uh, there had not been a split yet in the church. So these are books from the Bible, uh, including the Book of Wisdom. And oftentimes, holy wisdom is associated with Christ. Also, wisdom is a feminine noun. Uh, so she's often associated with the Virgin Mary. Now, that phrase, unspotted mirror, in Latin it would be speculum sine macula, or the mirror speculum without sine macula, spot, the mirror without spot. Uh, and this is a frequent symbol of Mary's purity. There's no mirror hanging up here. It's just a name that's given to her. And going back to the light, the light that's passing through the glass. And Jan van Eyck doesn't need little, little drawn lines to show you light coming through the glass. Um, you know, we see the light filling the upper part of the church and, uh, and uh, spots of light on the floor. And of course, that's going to remind us of that medieval hymn. 
as the sunbeam through the glass passes, but not stains. So the virgin, as she was, a virgin still remains. And of course, that is the metaphor for the virgin conception using light. Uh, light passes through a glass window, but it doesn't break it. Just as Christ enters with the conception and leaves with the birth, Mary's womb, without damaging, without harming her virginity. So light passes through the glass window. You'll notice that Mary is wearing this glorious crown. It's, it's incredible uh, goldsmith's work here, studded with precious jewels, and of course, done in you know, a great deal of detail. Mary is the queen of heaven, so it is appropriate for her to wear this very lavish crown. We also see Christ here as, as, as a newborn infant, uh, just a, a just a tiny little baby. And so that feeling of uh, nurturing, of perhaps uh, uh, just recently having given birth. And we see the image of Mary several times, uh, not just the large figure of Mary that John Beth has painted, but right behind her, you can see this arch with uh, candles on either side of a statue of the Virgin and Child. Uh, so you have here the uh, stone statue of the Virgin and Child in the niche. Uh, and people you know, come and light candles to this. Uh, when I've been in Europe, uh, I would say almost every church has a little, usually Gothic statue, but has a statue of the Virgin and Child uh, where people can light candles to her. Uh, and very frequently there will be little plaques up on the wall nearby that say in whatever the language, thank you, Mary. Danke, Maria. Merci. Um, some of them were particularly moving to me because they they said, thank you, Mary, for bringing my son home from the war, They're about World War II there. So this is not something they just did a long time ago. This is something um, that is still part of the Christian religion, the Catholic religion. So we have this picture of Mary as an effigy, the statue, but also in color, the beautiful image of Mary that Jan van Eyck has painted as though the true Mary, you know, the heavenly Mary has appeared in all her glory in the church. And she is the church. And then you can look through the other archway and we see uh, angels uh, probably singing in the choir with the altarpiece behind it. So that marks this as the eastern end of the church. Now, I know students are not interested in dates, um, but there is a reason why people get very interested in the chronology of works of art because it shows the development of the artist's style. And sometimes, of course, it's useful to know when something was created because if you want to, say, uh, associate it with an event, um, it would be a good idea to know the date. So people have tried to figure out the chronology of Jan van Eyck paintings. Uh, fortunately, there are a number of paintings by Jan van Eyck that actually have dates on them, that he painted dates. Uh, think of the man in the red turban, for example, uh, or the Ghent altarpiece. This one does not have a painted date that has survived. And Panofsky and many other art historians for a long time uh, thought that this was an early painting by Jan van Eyck, and they dated in the 1420s. I remember 1426, or how you could be so exact, I don't know, but you know, early in his career. And they thought it was because it was so small and delicate. Um, and they had this idea that Jan van Eyck may have started as a miniaturist. Um, there is a manuscript, which actually much of it has been destroyed, but there are some photographs uh, called the Milan Turin Hours because it um, was divided between uh, libraries in both cities. 
Uh, and they thought Jan van Eyck had painted that. Um, and also some of them thought Hubert had, Jan, and some of them thought Hubert van Eyck, Jan's brother, had also been involved in the painting of the Milan tour in ours. Today, many more art historians think that the Milan tour in ours are so close to Jan's style because there's somebody painting, imitating his style. And it's possible that they may even paint some um, copies of some lost Jan van Eyck paintings. Uh, but not everybody thinks that they are painted by the hand of Jan van Eyck, but they're certainly influenced by him. Um, but you know, it's not a really good idea to try to date something by the size of the painting. Because after all, size is something that would be determined presumably by the patron. Uh, it's not a criterion for, for, for painting. Uh, for, it's not a criteria for dating a painting. In other words, uh, an artist didn't paint one size all the time during certain years. That just doesn't make any sense. Uh, if he's given a commission for a huge altarpiece, he's going to paint the huge altarpiece. If he's given the commission for a small uh, devotional image, and this certainly, uh, being only about 12 inches high, would have been used for personal devotions. So we really can't say that because of the size of something that relates to when in the artist's career was painted. Jim Snyder wrote an article about it, and he compared it to another small, um, and he compared it to another small, precious painting by Jan van Eyck. Uh, it's known as the Dresden Triptych or the Dresden Madonna, and uh, that work they had at one point called an early work by Jan van Eyck, but what happened was they cleaned it and they found that there was an original date on it that had been painted over and the date was pretty late in Jan van Eyck's career, 1437. And so Jim Snyder compared the two and said that this probably dates from late in Jan van Eyck's career. Um, you know, by comparison with the Dresden Madonna. Now, we know that this painting was influential. We don't know how these particular people uh, got to see it, but you will remember that Jan van Eyck was um, a member of the Duke's household. He was a court painter. So other people connected with the court uh, might be able to see some of his paintings and show them around. Uh, and of course, wealthy people can afford to have paintings. So uh, there were several copies of this. And you can see one by the master of 1499. He's called that because we don't know his name. Uh, but there's the date, 1499. Uh, the other one is by Jan Hossart, who we'll hear about later in the class. Uh, and this is probably from the very first years of the 16th century. They're just saying around 1500 to 1510. And as you can see, these are you know, pretty close copies. Uh, the artist's style uh, makes it different, but uh, pretty close copies of uh, Jan van Eyck's Madonna in the church. But they also have a second panel. Now, we know the patron of the master of 1499's painting. It's Christine de Holt, who's a canon, as you can see, and his name means dog, so it's kind of cute because he's got the little dog there lying. Uh, is it a, just a reference to his name, or did he also have a little dog uh, that he wanted painted in the picture? And he is at his prey do, kneeling with his book of hours, perhaps, open in front of him, praying perhaps the little office of the Virgin. And on the other panel, we see the Virgin in the church, as it were, appearing in front of him. Only she's showing in the church or as the church, and he's showing in a beautifully appointed uh, little private room. 
The other picture that I'm showing you here by Jan Hosart on the left uh, has a wing, a panel, with the donor who is kneeling. And uh, it is St. Anthony behind him, St. Anthony Abbott, uh, who is you know, sort of introducing him to, to the Virgin, as it were, uh, vouching for him. And there's, he's in a beautiful landscape. So that's very frustrating to us in a way because, of course, if the uh, setting were the same in both, we'd think, oh, yeah, he copied that too. But the settings are different. So we don't know what uh, the putative donor panel of the Madonna in the Church by Jan van Eyck might have been. Uh, it does suggest the possibility that there once was a panel with the donor painted on it, uh, and then these were hinged and could close up and you know, could be opened up. Or at least it was used in that fashion uh, by around you know, 1500, some years later. This painting's in Frankfurt, so sometimes it's known as the Frankfurt Madonna. It's also known as the Luca Madonna because it was in the Luca collection. Um, what it shows is Mary nursing the Christ child. And I thought it's kind of interesting when we look at these paintings by Jan van Eyck. They have things that are so human and then things that are aristocratic or royal. Uh, and remember, that Jan van Eyck is working for a court. So although Mary was historically um, the wife of a carpenter and certainly would not have had a throne or jewels, um, she was considered to be the queen of heaven. And she would be lavishly uh, appointed uh, just as the aristocrats of the 15th century wanted to show off their wealth and power by having you know, beautiful clothes, beautiful tapestries, beautiful things. So we're seeing Mary nursing her son. And it's as though she's at the end of a little room or a niche with a throne with a cloth of honor hanging above her head. And this, of course, is what kings and dukes would have, uh, a beautiful cloth in the background and then a canopy coming out over their head. And she has this very precious rug that is at her feet. And you might notice if we're in our imaginations, we're standing right there close to Mary. It's almost like we could process up that rug and uh, you know, up the carpet and come closer to us. It, it leads our eye to, to her. On the arms and the back of the throne, we see lions carved. Now, the throne of King Solomon was supposed to have been carved with lions. So when you see these lions, we believe that they refer to the throne of Solomon. And Solomon was known for his wisdom. And so we see these lions as a reference to Christ as holy wisdom and to the Virgin as the throne of wisdom. Well, that's all these royal things. And yet also it is an intimate scene with a mother who loves her child and who is nurturing her child. She's feeding her child. Uh, maybe I should say something. Um, I had a student many years ago who gave me a wonderful paper on this painting. And he was surprised to see a painting where the Virgin is displaying her breast. Uh, he did his research and he found out about that and we'll, we'll talk about that. But remember, at that time, that's how babies were nursed. This is how babies got their food. Uh, they couldn't go and buy formula at the local supermarket. Um, if the child died, excuse me, if the mother died, uh, you would try to find a wet nurse for her. And in fact, in royal circles, in, in aristocratic circles, um, mothers did not always nurture their children by breastfeeding. They might hire a wet nurse. 
That way the mother didn't have to be with the child you know, all the time. The, the wet nurse would take care of them. So when you're seeing Mary nursing that child, it really establishes this love of the mother. And it's also something that you know people would know about. Every one of them was nursed. Uh, their wives nursed their children. The mother, women who might see this nurse their children. Um, when you see breasts in these paintings, uh, you're saying nurture. And it does seem very odd that our society equates breasts with sex rather than with their function, nurturing a baby. Enough said. We'll also see what else it refers to. The nursing Madonna, Mary nursing the baby Jesus, is often associated with intercession. Now, we talked about this idea of the nurturing mother, but there are paintings of Mary at the Last Judgment, in which she is kneeling by the throne of Christ and she's showing her breast. And what she's doing is basically she's saying something like, I nursed you. You know, I'm your mother. You know, I changed your nappies. <laughs> I took care of you. I nursed you. Can't you save just one more sinner for me? So it's Mary, you know, calling upon her position as the person who nurtured Christ. You know, she's saying, I'm your mother. <laughs> You know, and obviously a son should honor his mother and father. And if she's asking for more people to be saved at the last judgment, well, he just might do that. So that's another thing that when you see the mother Mary with her breast exposed, that we think of the last judgment. We think of her as interceding for sinful humanity. There's also legends of the saints. Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, who's called the Marian Doctor because of his devotion to Mary, is said to have had a vision of Mary where she appears and squeezes the milk. I've read one where it says three drops of milk and they fall in his mouth. And I've also seen, of course, um, prints and paintings where, you know, there's a stream of milk coming out. So the idea is that, uh, you know, Mary is nurturing the faithful as well not just the Christ child. And if she is a personification of the Holy Church, then you know the church is providing this nourishment as well, the spiritual nourishment. Now, one of the things that we see very frequently in early Netherlandish painting and very often in Jan van Eyck are these objects around the room. And you know they're extremely naturalistic. Uh, people, you know, for a long time just love to marvel at uh, how how much they look like the real thing and the way the light shines on them. And of course, we know that Jan van Eyck uh, is probably the greatest master for showing you the detail and showing you, you know, the uh, painting things that look so very real. And I want you to think about what could be the function of these objects. Well, one, it, you know, it shows, certainly it does to us. We look at it, it shows off the skill of the artist. These objects are things that you know, people might see. Basins, vessels, carvings, fruit. And that seems to make it perhaps m more real to us that these holy persons, and you'll see sometimes they are, you know, they are showing as though they were in, in this case, you know, a, um, a wealthy Netherlandish person's house. Uh, you know, they, they seem to be part of the world, if we were 15th century person, uh, around us. It's as though the holy persons, Christ and Mary, are there among us. That makes it real to us, if we are you know, the devotee who is saying their prayers in front of this image. And then, of course, there is the idea that these objects are symbolic. Now, Erwin Panofsky talked about disguised 
symbolism or hidden symbolism. Um, those particular terms were attacked. And for one reason, because uh, some people thought that he was saying that they were disguised at the time and we're so clever we figured it out. That's not what he said. That's a, simply a misunderstanding that some students who maybe didn't read his book, uh, his books, um, thought that's what it meant. Uh, you know, obviously he was not painting something for 20th century art historians to write articles about. He didn't know there would be 20th century art historians. So there's two thoughts about this. I'm going to call them not disguise symbols, but naturalistic symbols or naturalistic objects that could serve as metaphors or could serve as references or could serve as symbols relating to the holy persons, in this case the Virgin Mary. I will also tell you that there are other people who say no. You know, they aren't symbols, they're simply showing you what wealthy people at the time had, you know, they're setting the, the scene. They're simply objects, carpets, basins, fruit, chairs. <laughs> and then there's something in between. Like, not everything is a symbol, but if we have good reason to believe that these objects are symbolic, remember how people of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance could have looked at the world. The world in itself was a kind of symbol of God. Um, remember that God was supposed to have given omens of the coming of Christ throughout history. So when they read the Bible, um, you know, there are many ways of reading the Bible, uh, but one of them was to find where in the Old Testament uh, they believed that uh, God was giving hints or prophesying, suggesting the coming of Christ. And, you know, the secular world was full of symbols too. Um, if you are a knight, jousting, you know, you would have uh, an emblem that was yours. And you could be identified even when you were completely covered up with plate armor. Um, great houses had, you know, symbols and coats of arms. So it seems possible, certainly, that some of these objects may be symbols especially when we see them over and over and we have literary sources such as the window and that medieval hymn. Remember, light passes through the window without breaking the window, without marring the window as a kind of, you could say, an analogy, a metaphor uh, for the virgin birth. That's the birth, when we say the virgin birth, we're talking about Christ being born from a virgin, which is a Christian belief. Um, so we have a window with light coming through. On the windowsill, here on the left, you'll see some fruit. And maybe you're showing that, what, they're wealthy people and could afford fruit and left it out to ripen? Well. Maybe, but also perhaps it could be a reference to the forbidden fruit. Um, the fruit of the tree of knowledge in Genesis. God says you can eat from any other fruit, any other tree, any other plant, but do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's the forbidden fruit. And of course, the first sin of mankind was to take the fruit and eat it. You remember St. Paul is talking about Christ as the new Adam. So it's a very frequent um, comment that Christ is the new Adam who redeems the sin of the old Adam. And then there's another possibility. Um, I gave a paper several times about this in which I suggested not only, you know, did the fruit refer to you know, the uh, atonement for the sin of mankind? And I had another idea. 
that in addition to the idea of the fruit referring to the forbidden fruit, and then with the presence of Christ re referring to the atonement for mankind's sin, that the fruit might mean something else. And I don't know if you can see it, but right up next to the virgin's womb, the Christ child is holding fruit. And this reminded me, of course, of the fructus ventris, which means the fruit of the womb. And in the Ave Maria, Ave Maria, gratia plena, in the Hail Mary, thou who art full of grace, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. So could it also refer to Christ as the fruit of Mary's womb? And then to you know, Mary's virginal state when she gave birth to Christ. And part of her role in salvation, that uh, you know, she is the God-bearer, the Theotokos, which was a title given to her in uh, the fifth century at the Council of Ephesus. Mary is the God-bearer. Okay, so we've talked about the fruit. Let's look at that niche in the wall uh, on the right. We see a basin filled with clear water. We see a glass vessel also with water in it. And that glass vessel, you know, you could, light can penetrate that too without breaking it, just like it goes through the window. So could that refer to the virginal conception. Also, they both have water in them. Um, clear water could certainly refer to purity, the purity of the virgin, perhaps. Uh, and some people go a little further and they'll say something like the basin of water could be associated with baptism. And since baptism is one of the saving sacraments, you know, this could certainly refer to uh, salvation in general. Now, a little close up here, uh, the color is a little off, uh, but once again we see the light reflecting off the jewels, the details of the texture of the carpet, and of course I want you to remind you that Jan van Eyck was a court painter, uh, and things like jewels, thrones, rich carpets would be something you would associate with uh, the aristocrats. And uh, so essentially Mary has the same social status. Well, she's the queen of heaven, uh, so she's superior, uh, but she is within that, uh, showing her as though she was an aristocrat, essentially, uh, an enthroned queen of heaven. We have several paintings of uh, Jan van Eyck uh, of the Annunciation. You've already seen the Annunciation that is on the outside of the Ghent altarpiece. This particular one is in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. And as you can see, it's very tall and thin and colorful. And we think that that means that it was probably the left wing of a triptych. So, there was probably another panel uh, in the center, and uh, you know what could it be? That various possibilities, of course, uh, an adoration of the Magi, a nativity come to mind, but there could be other things as well. Uh, and then another painting on the other side. Um, thinking of some later paintings, we think of having perhaps uh, an Annunciation, adoration of the Magi, a presentation in the temple, but. As I say, there's other possibilities. Whatever this was attached to, it, the rest does not survive. Now, I should tell you a little bit about the condition of this. Uh, it used to be in the Hermitage in uh, St. Petersburg. That's Russia, not uh, Florida. And it was acquired by... Uh, George Mellon. 
And it became the basis of the founding of the National Gallery of Art, which was based on his, it was based on his collection. At some time, probably, um, bef well, definitely before we acquired it, uh, probably sometime in Russia, uh, the surface was transferred. It would have been painted on wood, on Baltic oak, because that's what other paintings from this time and place often are. Uh, but this was transferred to canvas, probably because the wood was either, you know, rotting or wormholed. In some ways, the support was disintegrating. And so the surface was then transferred to canvas. Um, they also transferred uh, the uh, underdrawing as well. And with infrared reflectography, they have been able to show that this is an extremely detailed underdrawing. There's a lot of paint losses in the Virgin's garment. So that's been pretty much repainted. Uh, sometimes you'll see some older pictures of it and you say, well, the folds aren't in the same place. That's because those were really overpainted. Uh, but there are other parts of it that turned out to be in really beautiful condition, particularly the robes of the angel. Now, when this would have been painted, you would have had, of course, layers of oil glazes, um, which, because light shines off of oil, you would have luminosity, not just the painted luminosity, which you know we're, we marvel at. You know, he makes it look like light is shining on these different surfaces, uh, but also the actual luminescence, as it were, of the painting surface. And when you're having layers of glazes, uh, there's a certain transparency or translucency uh, that gives depth to the uh, the color. And of course, it's very rich color. So. Here you see uh, the angel Gabriel, uh, richly dressed with cut velvet brocade and golden embroidery and jewels and his own crown and uh, curling locks. And uh, you know, he's a, a smiling angel, which you see frequently in Gothic art. Uh, and his words are coming out of his mouth. You can see Ave Grazia. It's a little sign above the grazia that shows it's abbreviation, abbreviated. But of course, we know the words. In fact, you can start to see the, the letter P for plena next. Uh, Hail, full of grace. The colors, as we said, they're beautifully bright, saturated colors um, with clear edges, you know, lots of clarity to this. And the picture seems very solid and three-dimensional. You can see uh, we are looking down at the um, floor. And we can also see the ceiling. But it doesn't look skewed. It looks perfectly great. Uh, you can say the people are too big to be that big in the church, or the church is a pretty small one. But except for that, the, the dual scale, it, it seems very real. Now, the National Gallery of Art used to have a computer program where you could go in and take out the figures, and then they showed you the perspective lines and showed you that they did not meet at a single vanishing point. Because, of course, Jan van Eyck never used that type of one-point perspective where you have a single vanishing point. Uh, there's been a lot of articles written about uh, van Eyck's perspective, uh, and it was not Brunelleschian perspective. Um, the Italian way of showing uh, mathematical depth by having a single vanishing point, usually on the horizon, uh, with which all of the straight lines meet, all the uh, lines that are uh, oblique to the picture surface meet. Um, Jan van Eyck didn't use that. The first person we know who used that uh, in Northern Europe seems to be Petrus Christus, whom we'll hear about later. And so that would be by the second half, or around the middle of the uh, 15th century, depending on how you date some of Petrus Christus's work. But it's, we talked about optical perspective. It looks right. 
And so, you know, they are existing in a believable space. Once again, you see all of those luxurious textiles and you, know, uh, you can tell what kind of fabrics are there, the different uh, textures of all of the different uh, objects, and of course the luminosity. Some of these are pictures I took on film and we've digitalized. Now, I should go over this. Um, reminding you where the Annunciation comes from. Uh, it's from the uh, Christian New Testament, a biblical subject with Luke, first chapter, uh, verses 26 to 38. The angel Gabriel comes to Mary. He, t he tells her that she will bear a child, Jesus. And as we've said repeatedly, and you're probably going to hear it again, uh, this moment marks the incarnation when, according to Christian belief, God becomes man in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And the words are written. Remember, they were also written on the Ghent altarpiece annunciation. Uh, the words are written as though they're coming out of Gabriel's mouth. Ave gratia plena. The angelic sal that is the angelic salutation in the beginning of the most popular prayer, Hail Mary, full of grace. Ave Maria, gratia plena. Dominis tecum. After the angel tells her that she's going to bear this child, uh, Mary asks, how can this be? I know no man. In other words, she's a virgin. How can she have a child? And the angel replies, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And the child will be called the Son of God. And then upside down, and we always say it's upside down so God can look down from heaven and read it. Mary consents to God's will, uh, and she says, Eke Angela Domini, behold the handmaid of the Lord. And according to the Christian theologians, it was at that moment that the incarnation occurred. In other words, Mary consented to God's will. This gave permission for the conception. And you can see the rays of light coming down uh, with the dove of the Holy Spirit uh, sort of, you know, uh, following along the rays uh, as he approaches Mary. Now, and we've talked about symbolism. And, you know, there are certainly things that I don't think anybody disagrees are symbolic because they are so common. Uh, they have biblical authority or some other textual authority, and they're extremely frequent in art. On the other hand, there are objects that people interpret as symbolic, but other people say, oh no, you're just making that up. So I want you to think about it. Do you think that this is reasonable? And what do these, if they are symbols, what do they add? Because they really do seem to add um, layers of meaning, things you can meditate on. Remember, you always have to remember, these are religious works of art. How were they used? They weren't hanging in museums. They were used for devotions. They were used in the liturgy the rites of the church, if they're on an altar, for example, they would tie in with the theology and the teachings of the church, as well as the religious experience of people who, you know, use them sometimes for private devotions, depending on what the work of art was. Now, you know, we've said this before, uh, the Holy Spirit is represented by a dove. You see this in not every Annunciation painting, but in most of them. Um, sometimes you also see a little Christ child carrying a cross instead of the dove. You know, he's really coming down uh, as, a, as the incarnation. In this case, we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, and the metaphor is not in the story of the Annunciation. It's in another book of the Bible, Matthew. Third chapter of Matthew, verse 16. It's part of the baptism of Christ. 
um, you know, Christ has been baptized, uh, and it says that the Spirit of God descending like a dove. It is a simile, it is a metaphor. And from that, they start using the dove as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Um, you also see lilies, uh, which are conceived of sometimes as a, a representation of Christ, uh, but also conceived as, as Mary's virginity or Mary's purity. And it's been remarked that having these lilies bloom on March 25th is a miracle. Uh, what? Let's explain that a little more. Why March 25th? March, March 25th is Annunciation Day. In many towns in medieval and Renaissance Europe, the first day of the new year was not January 1st, but was March 25th. It was the date that marks the incarnation of Christ, that marks the Annunciation. And how long does it take for a child to grow in a womb? Uh, we usually say it's nine months. And so nine months before, what, Christmas Day, December 25th, is March 25th. Now, of course, we know that the reason we mark the uh, birth of Christ with uh, December 25th, there's no biblical authority for that. It's, it's uh, uh, a Roman feast of Saturnalia. And the idea was if they could replace the feast days and the festivities and the holidays, only they wouldn't have used holidays because that comes from holy days, but well, I guess they might have. Um, but at any rate, um, now the Bible does not say that Christ was born on December 25th. It does not give a date. Um, the date of December 25th was picked because it was the time of Saturnalia. Uh, which was a Roman holiday, and if you can replace your Roman festivities uh, with Christian ones, uh, people don't feel like they're giving up as much, I guess. Uh, and uh, this was uh, something that the church did, uh, you know, to replace the pagan holiday with the Christian holiday. Uh, so count back nine months, and you have March 25th, Annunciation Day. Now, in Northern Europe, it's still pretty cold. Uh, in March, and you're probably not having a lot of flowers blooming, at least not outside. They might have hot houses, but uh, so, you know, here's this idea, it's March 25th, and already you have these beautiful flowers, so that's says, ha, huh, it's a miracle. We've seen a number of times when Mary is shown in some kind of uh, ecclesiastical looking structure. And of course, we also see it here, right, in a church. Now, you'd say, well, wait, that's uh, anachronistic. There weren't any churches at the time of the conception of Christ when Mary lived. So why would she be in a church? We've seen it in earlier manuscripts. And you'll remember, we talked about this with the uh, Madonna as the church, the little painting in Berlin, that Mary was associated symbolically as the church of Christ. The Annunciation also was believed to be the beginning of the new covenant or the beginning of the new era under grace. So Jan van Eyck is not trying to, you know, archaeologically show us exactly what it looked like at the moment when Christ was conceived. Um, he's showing us something that is rich with multiple meanings. And here's some things that have been suggested that we should look at. There are three windows behind Mary, which might well represent the Trinity. There's a stained glass window showing God the Father, and they're very faint, but uh, up on either side, there's paintings from the life of Moses, who was believed to be the predecessor of Christ, and he, of course, is the lawgiver. And you remember, we have the era uh, before the law, and then with, the, with Moses, we have the era under the law, and then when Christ is conceived, it begins the era under grace or mercy. Uh, when you look at the floor, you'll see the zodiac and Old Testament scenes. And then there is that footstool or whatever it may be, uh, which has been something that a number of people have written about. 
can't say we know what it means, but I'll tell you a few things. Okay, look at the floor. The floor is inlaid with a what, grapevine design as a border and roundels with the different zodiac signs. See the crab? See Leo the lion? And in the rectangles between them, there are different scenes from the Bible. Here we see Samson uh, pulling down the building. He's going to kill the Philistines. Below that, we see David cutting off the head of Goliath. So you know, evil being defeated by good is how it would have been interpreted. And there's something else that Panofsky suggested, and you know, people have argued that it's not true and that it is true. So I'm going to tell you the story. Um, and you've seen this mentioned in, in the textbook a number of times, that sometimes you seem to have a mixture of building styles in the buildings that are associated with the Virgin Mary at the time of the Annunciation. In this particular church, and you know, we'll have to go back and look at it again. Now, I want to talk to you about some symbolism that we've actually seen before. If you've been reading your text and you've looked at uh, some of the buildings uh, that are associated with Mary at the time of the Annunciation, you'll notice a mixture of architectural styles. And you'll see that here, too. Now, we sometimes talk about Romanesque art. And I want you to be really understand this. Romanesque art does not mean Roman art. It's a name that art historians have given to a medieval style of architecture uh, with rounded arches, you know, very thick walls, uh, often uh, windows that are much smaller than the ones that they have later in the Gothic period. Uh, this is a style that is from the 11th and uh, maybe the early part of the 12th century. Of course, it lasts longer some places. The modern art of the 15th century in Flanders would be Gothic. Uh, Gothic style began um, in the 1140s in the Ile de France, right around Paris, and it expanded. And uh, by the 15th century, you know, Gothic was everywhere. So if you were building a new church in the 15th century in Flanders, you'd build it in the Gothic style. Now, they didn't use the words Gothic. They didn't use the words Romanesque. But let's take a look at what Jan van Eyck is doing here. If you look at those windows in the Claire story, that's the windows at the top with the light coming in, you'll notice that they are rounded arches. But if you look at the windows at the bottom level, they are slightly pointed, as though they, it was, this was an early Gothic building. But that doesn't make any sense. It takes hundreds of years sometimes to build a church. And so, yes, it would be perfectly possible to start out building your church in what we call the Romanesque style, the older style. And then as you build higher, you might update it by using the newer, more modern Gothic style. And there are buildings like that. You know, they've got Gothic towers on you know, a Romanesque building, for example. But it doesn't make any sense to start building in the Gothic style, the modern style, and then change to an old fashioned style as you get further up. And not just this painting, of course, but some of the other paintings we've looked at and you know, others which you will not be seeing in the class. Panofsky noticed that there did seem to be this connection, that where Mary was, it was Gothic or early Gothic. And other parts of the buildings looked earlier, more Romanesque. So he suggested that this was symbolic, that it showed the era under law the era of Moses in the old style, 
in this case equated with Romanesque. And you can see here that uh, with that round arch, we have the uh, image of God the Father in the stained glass window. And on either side, I don't know if you'd make it out if not in the pictures, but on either side, there's paintings showing scenes from the life of Moses. So that's, you know, the Moses part, the era under law. And the Christians believed that that was superseded and succeeded uh, by the era under grace, which came into being at the moment of the incarnation. And uh, that made the idea of grace being mercy. Man does not deserve to be saved, but because of the grace of God, the mercy of God, um, he can be. Okay, why am I showing you this? If I, I hope you can see it. When they cleaned this painting, in the 1990s, it had beautiful restoration, they found some things that had been overpainted. When they cleaned off the overpaint that was over the ceiling, they found that Young and I had painted it as though the ceiling were breaking up. There were some boards missing, but the ceiling was damaged. And Carol Pertel, Carol Pertel, who was the um, professor of Northern Renaissance art at Memphis for a, quite a while, and she was the founder of the Historians of Netherlandish Art. Um, sadly, she's now deceased. Uh, her dissertation uh, is the Marian Paintings of Jan van Eyck, which was published by Princeton University Press. And she's done all sorts of wonderful uh, you know, research on Jan van Eyck. And, I know one time she said to me, she said, well, I didn't believe, the, you know, the Panofsky idea of the, the architectural thing until they cleaned that painting. <laughs> and when she saw the damaged roof, it was as though he was saying, you see, that, uh, you know, the old law is damaged. It's not as good. And it will be the new law down here with Mary, uh, not about the new law. Uh, he, what he was saying was, that the old law, the part with the Romanesque architecture and the pictures of Moses, was damaged. It was coming apart. And then, as Christ enters the world, down there in the lower part of the church with Mary and the Gothic arches, this is the more perfect solution to salvation. Uh, rather than just trying to follow the law, nobody seems to be able to do that. God has to extend grace or mercy. So the old law at the top and the new era under grace, the Christians would associate with themselves in the church. Uh, and of course, here we have the three windows representing the Trinity. So you have God the Father up above and then all three symbolically represented by the three windows. Okay, shall I just review this? I think I've been saying it all along. Um, the Christian concept of history and the doctor of salvation is that, that history is divided into three eras. One is before the law. And the idea was that from the time of Adam, who sinned, throughout history, God was trying to get people into heaven, but they weren't good enough. And they just kept sinning. And so he sent the flood. And Noah's descendants kept sinning. So finally he sent the law, which of course is the Ten Commandments, and the other uh, laws in the Pentateuch, particularly in Numbers and Leviticus. Sort of, Here are the rules, follow these and be good. Only people kept sinning couldn't get into heaven. So there was this era under the law. And then God decided that the only way to save mankind was by a perfect sacrifice that would atone for all the sins of mankind. But no human was able to do that. But it had to be a human. So God himself took on human flesh. and sacrificed himself. This is a Christian idea of 
it's called atonement, it's called expiatory redemption. And in other words, man can't save himself, somebody else had to do it for him. Uh, he is saved only by grace or by mercy. And as we've said before, the moment of the incarnation is, the, is at the Annunciation. And the incarnation is the first sacrifice for God to become man is a huge sacrifice. And then it culminates eventually in the crucifixion and death of Christ, which is the, the ultimate sacrifice. And that begins the era under grace. <laughs>